Uh, chapter number 28, which talks about church membership and attendance. So this is, uh, we all know, of course, from without saying, we shall come to church. So that's pretty much, we can just skip this lesson. I'm just kidding. Everybody come to church. There we go. So that's the short answer. But let's go through the Bible answer and why the Bible, how the Bible digs into and demonstrates to us what is the importance of church attendance. You know, first of all, we start from a position that Christ takes about the church. Christ loved the church. You know, it says in Ephesians 5.25, He loved the church and gave Himself for it. So, if Christ is to be our example and who we're to emulate in life and who we're to look towards, then if He loves the church, then it should stand to reason that we should love the church. We should love everything that the Lord loves. If the Lord loved the world enough to give Himself for it, we should love the world enough to go out and give some of our time to it to witness about Christ. If Christ loved the church, then we should love His church. Yeah. Now, to love His church, if we're to demonstrate that love, that means, first of all, we need to become a member of a church. And after we become a member of a church, we need to be involved in that church. We need to uh, be involved in the different ministries of the church. We need to be involved in the different uh, work of the church. And we need to make sure uh, there's no way that you can be involved in a church if you don't show up. So attendance, then, is just part of it. We know that um, God is the head of this church. So if God is the head of our church, that means He's part of our church. He is part of this membership, part of the body. He's the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. You know, we go look into, um, Paul was writing about how to, we should, what our um, attitude should be towards the church. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty two, and he used the word despise. Which in, in that context means to think against or to disesteem. Just to basically to, to hold it down of low esteem, not to, to think of it much, kind of to neglect it when we despise it. When he asks the church there, he says, despise ye the church of God. You know, many Christians today don't perhaps despise the church of God. Not in the sense that we normally think of as the word despise, but in the fact that they don't give it much esteem. They don't give it much credence. They don't give it much importance in their life. That is despising the church of God. It must have been, a, obviously it was a problem back then as well. Paul wouldn't have had to address it. It's like, what is going on here? What's the problem here? Well, the main problem is it was becoming low priority. When church <laughs> becomes the low priority on our totem pole, and anything and everything can interfere with it, then we are despising the church of God. We, we shouldn't allow ourselves to get so busy or caught up in the things of this world that we neglect or we ignore God's church. This is something that God's church is very important to Him, so therefore it should be very important to us. You know, He had this wonderful love for the church. Ephesians 5.25 again says, Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. He gave Himself for it. And we're also told that we are to walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet, sweet smelling savor. That's kind of a mouthful. Sweet smelling savor. <laughs> but that's what God talks about our church. God's love for this church, God's love for each one of his churches is unmistakable. There's no way that we can be honest with ourselves and say that God doesn't love the church. If he loved it enough to die for it, in Acts 20, 28, it says, take heed, ye, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It's his possession. It's his church. It doesn't belong to any man. It doesn't belong to any pastor doesn't belong to any even group of members. It is his church. It was placed into our care, but it is his church. Yeah. And he's uh, given commandment after commandment to demonstrate his love for it. You know, John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. No greater love. Well, that's a demonstration of the greatest love. Okay? If that's, the, if that's the measuring stick for the greatest love is laying down your life, then we apply that's what Christ did for the church. So therefore, 
God has the greatest love for his church. That's important for us to understand. And this is something that he loves so much, he's also given it a responsibility. You know, generally, we don't give responsibility to, to anybody. It's someone that we have a close connection and relationship and love for that we're going to put in a position of responsibility in our life. So in the life of Christ, Christ here on earth, he gives responsibility to them, those whom he loves, and he gives responsibility to the church. He, there's a spiritual work that has to be done, and that's been assigned to the church. The church has, uh, basically, if you look at the Great Commission, there's three parts to it. First is to make disciples, teach them about Christ, get them saved, then we baptize them, and then we disciple them, we mature them, we teach them all the different things. Again, read what it said in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So first of all, we're going to teach them about Christ. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So here's this responsibility laid upon the church. What the church is supposed to do. The spiritual work that has to be done. And it, it's not given to any man. It's not given to any uh, anything outside of God's church. God's church is the one that's been given that assignment. Ephesians 3.21 says, I give be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout ages, world without end. Governments aren't responsible for this. Uh, social organizations aren't responsible for this. This is something that God's church has been given the assignment to do. You know, God called His church, He says in 1 Timothy 3.15, He calls it the pillar and ground of the truth. Pillar and ground. So think about that when you think about a, a building or a structure. The pillars are there to give support. And then the ground creates that foundation. So here's the, the foundation and the support of the truth is what the church is supposed to be. Become the <clears throat> we're the ones that are supposed to bring forth the truth. We're supposed to stand for the truth. We're not supposed to water it down. We're not supposed to muddy it up with anything wrong. We're supposed to simply preach God's word and teach the truth. It's the responsibility of God's church. <clears throat> it's a God's church is supposed to be someone who brings all mankind unto the Savior, teaching them about what He has done for them. When people walk into the doors of this church or any church that calls themselves God's church, any proper New Testament church, they should hear the message of Jesus Christ. They should hear the truth of the Scripture proclaimed in that church. Now that's God's love for the church. That's God's assignment for the church. But God does expect all people who are saved if you know him as your Savior, he expects you to be a member of one of his churches. There are a lot of people out there that's, that, well, I don't know how many, but I know there are some people out there that would say that, oh, I don't need to go to a church. I can just worship on my own. I can study on my own. But that is not the, the model that we see in the New Testament. We don't see individuals holding themselves up or even individual families saying, oh, we're just going to be a family church. We see individuals that are saved that come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ getting baptized and joining themselves together into a church. That is God's expectation. That's the pattern that we're supposed to follow. You know, he, when God established the church, when Christ established it, He said the believers are to be baptized. And we know that baptism adds believers to the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. We become a member of the body of the church. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day the Lord added unto them about 3,000 souls. We see this when we talk about the day of Pentecost. All this wonderful preaching that was going on, and all these people listening, and all this, well, the Holy Spirit just moving. And then it said 3,000 were baptized because they believed. So they believed the word and they were baptized and then that added them unto the body. 
Christ. So we see again this pattern of existence here. And even after that day, there was continually people going on and, and talking about the events of the day of Pentecost and all the wonderful things that happened. And, and more and more people were believing and more and more people were baptizing. As it says in Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So those that were saved were baptized and added to the church on a continual basis. So you can't take a look at this New Testament. You can't read through the book of Acts. You can't read through all these different uh, things that are written to us by the apostles and mistake the fact that believers became baptized, would join together, and would form churches. You know, it's all through the New Testament. All through it. We see it happening time and time again. We see uh, when Saul, who becomes Paul, when he trusted Christ, God sent him to Ananias. What did Ananias do? He baptized him. That's just the way, that's the pattern. That's what we're supposed to do. When Philip went down to Samaria and he preached Christ, there were lots of people that got saved. So it said in Acts 8, 12, it said, When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So here, down in Samaria, where Philip was, teach, was preaching, he now baptized a group of people. They now formed a church. When the jailer in Philippi, when he and all his house trusted Christ, it says in Acts 16.33 that, that uh, the same hour of the night, he watched, this is talking to Paul and Silas, watched the stripes, and he was baptized, he and all his straight way. So here, he became baptized right after he was saved. And he believed. And again, this Philippian jailer, along with Lydia and her household, the jailer's household, Lydia and her household, they became the church of Philippi. They were the founding members of that church. Time and time again, you see a church being formed in Corinthians, the church being formed in Ephesus. All the while, it's because preaching was brought to that city. People listened to the preaching. People believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. People were baptized, and therefore there was a church. Never was there any instance in the New Testament where you see an individual coming to know Christ, proclaiming Him as Savior, proclaiming to be saved, and then not being baptized, but going out and doing their own thing. That's not patterned at all for us in the New Testament. Nowhere do we ever see that happening. Believers always join together. They always worked together to do the work of God. There was no uh, private or freelance Christians in the New Testament. They all came together. And we know that uh, this also speaks of the fact of the plurality of churches. You know, some people try and say there's one and only one church. But, again, the pattern in the New Testament ref <coughs> refers to the plurality and pluralizes the word church. In Acts 9.31, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And this is uh, in Acts 15.41, Paul went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. In Acts 16.5, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. In Romans 16.4, Paul says, all the churches of the Gentiles and the churches of Galatia, the churches of Asia salute you. All, again, over and over and over again, the New Testament refers to churches, which is... Not exactly this lesson, but we'll touch back on the lesson we had not that long ago. A local, visible body assembled together. That's the church. The church. So there was multiples of those. So anyone who really studies Scripture and reads through the New Testament, it's, you cannot deny that the Lord wants saved individuals to be a member of one of His churches. It's, you, just can't, you just can't get past that. If you're going to be honest with yourself about what the Scripture says, you, you can't honestly say to yourself, God's okay with me just simply doing my own thing. That's not the pattern that's given for us in Scripture. 
So there's a lot of good reasons why we should be members of God's one of God's churches. There's a lot of different benefits. First of all, fellowship. We need fellowship with each other. We need that that support group surrounding us. You know, First John one seven says, if if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You see, we were never created to be alone. The human race was not created to be isolated. You know, when God created us, what was His? What was the purpose of Him creating us? He wanted fellowship with us. So we were designed with that draw towards fellowship. That's in our nature. That's how God designed us. And so we need other believers around us. We need that support group. If we're if we don't find that support in God's church, if we don't find that fellowship there, we're going to find it somewhere else because it's that we have a draw socially to other people. And if we don't find that f fulfillment in God's church, we're going to find it somewhere else that may take us down a path that we ought not go. And so we need each other in God's church to, to serve that purpose. Also, the Lord's church is supposed to edify. Preaching and teaching. Why do we go through this Sunday school hour? Why do we go through the preaching hour each and every Sunday? Well, because that's part of God's purpose for His church, is to edify the edification of the saints. It's how the scriptures say it. Which edification means the uplifting or the teaching. The people are taught through the church. That's part of God's church. That's part of the pattern that God laid out for His church is that they're to come to be taught and to, to learn more things about Christ. It's also a place for formal worship. What are the different aspects of worship? Well, it's a place for preaching. It's a place for praying. It's a place for singing. It's a place for giving. It's a place for the Lord's Supper. It's a place for baptism. And while there's absolutely nothing wrong, and not only is there nothing wrong, we should have private worship in our own lives. We should have our own private prayer, our own private Bible study. Uh, we also need a place for what you call corporate worship or public worship. And God established His church as that place for that public worship. And it's, uh, the church also provides an opportunity for us to participate in that great commission, that global missionary work. You know, we, as an individual, I'm probably not going to go out and find some guy and, and send him some money to help him go teach uh, across the seas. But as a church, we get together and we vote and we have a board of missionaries that we all support. And I myself personally, I, you know, I, I draw a salary from my job at Tarleton and that pays the bills at my home. But that's not enough to pay the bills at my home and to pay for somebody else that's uh, over in Europe trying to teach the gospel. But the little bit that I can give, plus the little bit that you can give, and the little bit that you can give, and the little bit that each of us can give, when we bring all that together, we can now help and support someone across the seas. So there's power in numbers. So as a member of a church, we can now help the missionary efforts. And it's important. Missionaries are important. You know, the Bible is clear on that. How should they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Someone has to be sent to preach the message. So we together can help that evangelism effort. We also know that faithful participation in the work of the Lord through His church provides, uh, it, it, it provokes other members to love and good works. When we see someone that we can look up to or someone that we admire and we see them dedicated to the work of Christ, it inspires us to be dedicated to the work of Christ. We see someone who, who is bold and stands up and, and proclaims the word of Jesus Christ. It, it, it helps embolden us to say the same thing. We look to those examples and we are, as the Bible says, provoked to love and good works. That's, all again, part of that fellowship aspect, that support group of one another. Also, membership in, in the church places a believer under the special protection and blessing of God. 
You see, because he is the savior of the body. He's the savior of the church. And he has put all things under his feet. This is what it says in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. God has put all things under his feet and given him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So we are part of the body of Christ when we are a member of his church. It puts us in that special position. And for us to be best blessed by God, we need to be obedient to him. For God to bless us the best, we need to make sure we're in a position of obedience. Otherwise, if we're out there on our own, um, we're out there and, and the devil's out there like a roaring lion looking to the valley. If we're out there on our own. And here that we see um, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 says this, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout ages, world without end. So we see, Christ has a special place for the church. He has a special blessing for the church. Also, this regular meeting, this regular assembly, is also something that pattern we are we pattern after Christ. <clears throat> you see, by you know, not only do we pattern that after Christ, but we are the fact that we meet every Sunday. It's a declaration to the world each Sunday that there is something that we stand for. That there is something that we worship. It's a reminder of the risen Savior. We see, we testify just by the fact that we're here. The fact that we show up each and every Sunday, we are testifying that we believe in a Savior who rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And that's why we meet on the first day of the week. And that we follow a risen Savior who is alive forevermore. You know, if, if he was not alive anymore, there would be no reason for us to meet and, and tout him and to worship him. It doesn't do any good to worship a dead person. But we worship a risen Savior. And so the fact that we meet and we worship him every Sunday testifies to the fact that he is a risen Savior. Now God does expect. First of all, we said God expects all of his people to become members. But God also expects all of his people to faithfully attend and to support his church. Jesus, first of all, set the example. As I said before, he's our example to look to. We're supposed to look and see what Christ does and pattern our life against him. Jesus personally said that believers are to follow his example. He says, for I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. And uh, Paul said this, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. So according to or after the example, follow his example, do what he does. Peter also wrote, for even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. So we're supposed to follow Jesus Christ's example. Now what did Jesus do? Was Jesus out there on his own all the time and doing his own thing? No. He met with his apostles. He met with his disciples. When he met, they, he taught them. He, they discussed things. Questions were brought forth. Answers were given. Uh, business of the church was conducted. Worship was done. All these different things were done while even Christ was here on earth. And he's given us, given us that example. You know, as he rose on the first day of the week, and it said the first Sunday thereafter, so again, the, the next first day of the week, he met with his apostles again. So then after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. 
So here he was meeting them again on a Sunday, meeting with them. And it said for 40 days, you know, he'd shown himself alive after, after his passion by many infallible proofs. That's what it said in Acts 1 and 3. He's talking about here, he met with them every Sunday for five consecutive Sundays. So here's Christ setting up the example of meeting together on the first day of the week. He set it as an example for us. Now after Christ left the earth and ascended back to heaven, did the apostles and everybody just stop meeting? No, they continued that. Of the Jerusalem church that said this, is that all that believed were together when they had prayed, the place was shaken when they were assembled. So they continued to assemble themselves together. <coughs> this regular assembly was the practice of the day. They would get together regularly to pray, to break bread, to study, to, to go out and reach other people. When, you know, when Paul was first saved, he met regularly with the church in Antioch for a year. It says, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. <clears throat> so, for Paul to be able to meet with them, there's no doubt that this group, this church at Antioch, met regularly. There could be no question. There could be no doubt about it. Uh, the church in Trous also assembled regularly. Acts 20, verse 7 says, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. So again, it was... On the first day of the week, they came together. There's that assembly going on. The church in Antioch again routinely assembled to do the work of God. It says in Acts 13, 1 through 3, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manon, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetriarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So here they are meeting together, and they're organizing, and they're conducting the business of the church, and they are about to send forth missionaries, Paul and Barnabas. And the church was, they gathered the church together, and all that God had done with them, and how he had, you know, after they'd gone on their missionary journey, they they came back and they gathered the church together and told all that God had done with them and how they, he had opened doors of faith to the Gentiles. So here again we see the gathering and this uh, talking about the missionary journey. And they, they taught about everything that they had done and, and it was an uplifting time for them. They celebrated together, the, the, which is a good thing for us. You know, we should celebrate the successes. We should celebrate the saving of a soul. Um, that's what was going on here as they met together. So, uh, those who would uh, reject the idea you, you have to be willingly ignorant of Scripture to reject the idea that New Testament believers met together regularly as a church. The Scriptures are plain and simple that that's that was the pattern to follow. That's what was going on. <clears throat> and I thought I'd be close enough to finish, but since I'm not that close to finishing, I won't push through it. I'll go ahead and let it be dismissed. And uh, we'll continue this either with y'all next Sunday, if Charlie's not here, or I'll continue with my group in the <clears throat> Let's uh, have a quick word of prayer and we'll be dismissed.